We are live on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. I'm Lindsay the Frugal Crafter along with Sarah. Hi! And today we are going to paint with my least favorite color. Do you know what color that is, Sarah? I believe it's green oxide. Chrome oxide chrome green. Chrome oxide green. Or oxide of chromium. <laughs> I just, that color has always just, I found it so offensive. It just always seems to ruin the party whenever you bring it in. But I decided today I was going to give it a fair shake and see if I could combine it with other colors to uh, make something pretty. And I thought it'd be nice to do a leaf. And I'll show you my reference photo here, which I have linked down below. And I just realized I got to turn my monitor on so I can see what I'm doing. Otherwise I'll be guessing. And um, so if you want to print that off or open it up on your screen, paint along later, that is, uh, that's linked up below. And uh, the thing with chrome oxide green is that it's so strong that it kind of overtakes whatever you um, you mix with it. By the way, this uh, video was brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. I'm using their Mimic watercolor brushes and also their Lucas paints. They are the United States distributor for Lucas, but if you live in other countries, I'm sure you can find it from a local distributor in your country. Um, and I will go over the pigments that we're using just so you can have an idea of what that, the full range, uh, well, the 48 set looks like. They have more colors than that. Um, um, but that's what it looks like and uh, they're really wonderful paints and uh, quite quite a bit more affordable than some of the other uh, artist quality paints out there so I was playing with this this morning and trying to figure out what colors I wanted to use so my first uh, my first attempt I used these uh, kind of neutral colors so I have my chrome side green there that's what it looks like this is what it looks like when you kind of swatch it out in a gradient um, then I had green gold which is PY 129 I had uh, English Red Deep, which is PR 101, and I had Indigo, and I thought I had grabbed Indithrone Blue, one which is PB 60, but I didn't. I grabbed Indigo, which is a mix. So I did, um, I did take some PB 60 and mix it with the Chrome Oxide Green, the Green Gold, and the Crimson, just so you could see. Oh, that was red, different red. I was using, I'm using the Crimson in the other one, but anyway, I was curious about that color. And so this is the, the swatches that I made and the different varieties I've got from those four colors together, which I thought was actually very earthy and autumn-like and pretty. And there you can see how the picture came out that I painted with those colors. So then I thought maybe it would be more versatile if I used brighter colors. So for this one, I decided to use, um, again, started with the chrome oxide green. That's what I used the most of. Then I used phthalo blue. Uh, green gold and alizarin crimson and I got um, pretty much the same results. I mean, that's how powerful chrome oxide green is. That's why I found it so offensive in the past is that it just takes over. So uh, we're going to paint this leaf and I actually haven't decided which color scheme I liked better. What do you think, Sarah? Should, the I big wasn't leaf actually or the little paying one? attention. I was watching oh. chat. <laughs> <laughs> you think the big leaf or the little leaf? What colors do you think um, look better? I kind I like the bigger leaf. I tend to go okay. for brighter colors anyway. And it's always easier to dull down a bright color. You can't brighten up a dull color. So we are going to use, these are all single pigment colors. We're going to use PG-17, which is your chrome oxide green. PY-129, which is a green gold, um, or it's called green yellow in Lucas, but it's, um, I think it's, I think the pigment name is like Azo Green. I think that's what it's, what the wording what it's usually called but it's PY129 alizarin crimson PR176 so it's the permanent version the quinacridone alizarin crimson and not the um, traditional alizarin crimson that it will fade and we have phthalo blue which is PB15 colon 6 but you can use whatever phthalo blue you have I know there are a few different versions uh, but that's the one in the Lucas palette and here you can see the variety of colors I have when I just do a general mix and I just did a little mixing chart there it makes a really pretty uh, skin tone when you do the green gold and the um, and the crimson so I have my picture already on my paper and um, I'm gonna go ahead and wet the entire leaf actually I'll go in with my flat brush and get a little bit more cover a little bit more at once I also want to let you know that um, I haven't mentioned in a long time, so those of you that are new probably don't know about it, but I did a class at Craftsy a couple years ago, and they have all of their classes on sale, and I linked up to mine in the video description. The DVD of that class is on sale for $19.99, and the streaming access is uh, on sale for $14.99, and that is a lifetime access. But they also have a, um, a service called Blueprint, which is a streaming service like Netflix for crafts, and that is, um, there's a seven day free trial going on now and it's like $14.99 a month if you like it and you wanna stay on there, but that's, it's all kinds of DIY from cooking to quilting, sewing, um, paper crafting, woodworking, gardening, all that stuff. So all that's linked up below if you wanna check it out. 
Um, if you buy a class on Craftsy, you have lifetime access to it. If you stream it on Blueprint, then you would only have access to it as long as you are a subscriber. So it's just like Netflix, but it's all crafty, crafty stuff. All right, I think I've got that pretty well wet. I usually don't go too close to the edge because I can always get in there with a smaller brush. You can just hold it to the light and see if you've got it wet or not. And I found some more, uh, I found some more cute dishes at a um, at a flea market, and I just alcohol ink them to hold more brushes and stuff. I love those little ridged dishes. They're really good for that. Okay, now we're gonna take chrome oxide green in all its glory. And uh, it's actually kind of a cool green. I always thought about it as a warm green because it's so um, opaque and kind of muddy, but it's actually quite cool when you put it up next to other greens. You can see that it's kind of got like almost like a, a minty undertone. It's, it's an odd color. And you'll see how it kind of overtakes everything as we start to paint. Uh, the Lucas paints have a lot of uh, good dispersion they do sell a paint, like you can get a pan of Oxgall if you want your paints to move more, but honestly, I've never felt like, oh, I wish these paints flowed more. They, they seem to flow really well, even this one, which I would think would be one that wouldn't tend to flow very well, being such an opaque color. Oh, if you have questions, put the word question in all caps, and then uh, that way you'll stand up to Sarah and the moderators, and they can make sure it gets answered so you don't get... You don't get lost in the shuffle. I saw a nice live stream yesterday over on uh, the Mind of Watercolor channel, and it, our very own um, Denise Soden from In Liquid Color was interviewed. She's a, one of our moderators, and it, it's a really nice, a really nice uh, chat. If you want to check that out on the Mind of Watercolor channel, it was posted last night. Marty Owens and Steve Mitchell were the interviewers. Ooh, I bet that was very informative. It was very informative. I didn't intend, well, I never seem to catch them live, so I'll listen to the replays while I'm like, getting ready for the live stream or something. But um, I had just made dinner, and I, for some reason, I was just feeling very like stressed out last night. And mm -hmm. I'll get stressed out, and then I'll eat fast, and my stomach will hurt. I'm like, I'm just going to go lay down for a minute. And I, and I turned on my phone because I had just downloaded a, uh, a library book. And of course, I didn't go right to my library app. I went right to YouTube and I saw that that was that had just started. So I'm like, ooh, and I watched it straight through for like an hour and a half. Denise says, thank you for coming by for Aww. it. Yeah, she's a really interesting person. She was a zoo educator. She does a lot of wildlife mm. art. So she's got that firsthand knowledge of animals. It's really it was really interesting to listen to her. So the color cover, covers really well. It does, um, it flows really well. I noticed where my paper was dry, it did seem to take, like it, it looks different underneath the paint than where it was wet. It definitely, it looks more, um, more solid and opaque where it was on that wet paper and then it flowed out better where it was on dry paper, which makes sense. But usually you don't see that much difference in the, uh, the finish of the color. And I do have this thinned down to about, I would say like 2% um, milk consistency on my palette. But this, there's gonna be some dark kind of, almost looks like, um, like when you overwater a plant, how it gets kind of, the leaves get kind of brown and die. That's kind of what the edges of this plant looks like. about overwatering plants. Okay, now into that color, I want to add something to brighten it. And it almost looks like on my monitor. Hey, could you turn your computer around? I want to see how it looks on that monitor because it almost looks extra flat. Can you tip the screen towards me a little bit? Okay, I think it's just my monitor. I was thinking this looked really gray. Um, no, it definitely, it, it, it looks green. green. Yep. Okay, because I, I just want to make sure they were getting the it could be the lighting too. You do have some bright lights. Yeah, right that over. could be, could be bouncing off my screen. So this green gold or Azo gold pigment one twenty nine is super vibrant. Vibrant. It's almost. It's very transparent too, and it looks almost neon. Um, but I do believe it's a fairly light, fast color. I'm gonna go in and throw it in some areas that I want to brighten up a little bit. 
And because this color is transparent and it's also very high chroma, it is going to compete with the um, with the chrome oxide green. Because chrome oxide green, it's kind of like if you're an oil painter and you use white, the white wants to gobble up everything. And that's kind of what the chrome oxide green does as well. So you gotta have a you gotta have a color that's going to hold its own against it, and that's what I find this color, this color does. So and I'm making sure my brush strokes kind of work towards the center vein going in the same angle that the the veins would go and i'm just trying to uh work this all while the first layer is wet so i don't end up with any backgrounds uh bev roberts i just got a large tube of daniel smith kyanite genuine and the label looks weird has anyone heard of counterfeit daniel smith paints happening i got it from amazon Oh my gosh, I have, I haven't heard of it, but um, it should say made in the USA if it's Daniel Smith. I would look look at the label for that, and maybe check and see where the supplier was. That oh you yeah, it did from. you did you order it from Daniel Smith? Because you, when you're on um, <clears throat> on Amazon, you can see who your supplier was, mm. or like a or an, or art store. Sometimes stores. Will oh right, right. So. Especially with art, I think I find that most of the purchases that I made on Amazon for art are third-party sellers. So, yep. not to say that third-party sellers is anything wrong with them. Jerry's Autorama has an Amazon store, so. But if it's somebody you've never heard of, you can look at their seller rating and and see. Usually, reviewers are pretty good about like outing a company that's selling counterfeit goods. Okay, that brings it up quite a bit. It will mute down a little bit as it dries. I know it looks a little fluorescent right now. Now I am going to go with, I wanna get my, I'm gonna grab some of the English Red and the Indigo. Oh wait, no, no, we're using, I gotta put that away. I'm gonna get confused. Okay, I'm gonna grab some Crimson and some Phthalo Blue. I forgot we're going with a brighter palette, which really doesn't matter because the green is so strong, it overtakes a lot. So that's what a Phthalo looks like. I'm using a number 12 round. Use whatever is comfortable for you. I'm gonna grab that English red deep. I gotta hold my swatch over to it because even though I just used it, I'm afraid it'll get mixed up. That's a the drawback to having to using a 48 pan set is that when you have all the colors and you've got like several browns next to each other, it's really easy to get confused as to what color you're using. So. Um, their 12 set is really lovely. Actually, I think the 12 set, the 12, uh, the studio set has, has the chrome oxide green, the, uh, like the $12 one that they have that has like their, their, their student grade paints. And I'm not sure the professional one might have Viridian or Hue. I can't remember, but, um, but that's a nice thing about having a smaller set is that you're not going to lose your way if you're a beginner. And even if you're more advanced, I'm just adding this color to some of the darker edges and I'm letting the, the water kind of wick it forward and that's really gonna give me the shape of those defined edges like I have here. I kind of let the water wick that brown around and we will be adding more later. So don't worry about it getting um, messed up. Like don't worry if, you're, if your thing doesn't look dark enough, you, you don't go in and add the extra dark now, you'll be able to glaze that on later. And if you don't like it, if you're like, oh, that went way too far, you just take your paper towel or even a rag, because you're not lifting up everything. Just kind of ball it so you've got a little bit of a point, and you can just blot it if it's too if it goes too far. The practice paintings I did on the Aqua B paper, and this final one here is on 140 pound cold press arches. Now, at one point, I'm not sure if the Lucas paints don't contain oxgall. I would think they do because of how it's flowing, but I seem to remember thinking that at one point that they didn't. But I could be misremembering that. If anybody knows in the chat, um, that would be great to know. Because they flow really well, so I think they would have to have oxgall in them, but they also sell uh, oxgall by the pan like Holbein does. So I thought, then Holbein doesn't have oxgall. So I was thinking maybe they don't either. Maybe that's what it was. 
Joe's here and Grace and oh good. Oh, we got a whole bunch of our regulars that are knowledgeable. So oh wonderful. We'll get the, we'll get the info. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know what people would think about the topic for the live stream. And I thought, oh, I, I, I feel bad saying I hate a color because, oh, that's such a strong word. Because I was asking my son, what should I title this? Painting with my least favorite color or painting with a color I hate? And he goes, oh, painting with a color I hate. And I was like, well, that's pretty aggressive. I don't know if I might offend people. But I took the, but I figured the 15-year-old, the almost 16-year-old probably knows a little bit more about <laughs> what people like on YouTube <laughs> than me. <laughs> Maybe. And we'll notice if we get a bunch of teenagers. Of course, they're all in school right now. <laughs> or they should be. They should be. Look at a bunch of delinquents showing up. Artists, art, artistic delinquents. Yeah. I'm dripping some more in there. I just want to intensify that color a little bit. Plus, I like watching it run. I haven't decided if it's if this color is going to make an appearance frequently or not, but I have to say I like it more than I did when I started. I bought a, one of the, um, not when I first started watercoloring, but probably when I first started getting back into it seriously, I was, um, cause I painted watercolor since I was really young and pretty much had the same watercolor paints for, um, or not very many different brands from the time I was seven to the time I was 20. And I remember seeing a clearance sale at a craft store and they were Grumbacher Academy watercolors and chrome oxide was one of the colors I grabbed because it looked so pretty on the tube. It looked like a sap green. And I think because I got so frustrated with that, like using that, that was a student grade and a color that was kind of muddy that I just kind of like always just kind of stuck in my craw as a terrible color. So it just goes to show you, give something another try sometimes and you might be surprised. I tell Eleanor all the time she has to try something at least two twice before she can say she doesn't like it. Yep, that's <laughs> so true. She's at that age where she'll look at food and she's like, I don't like that. Have you ever yep. tried it? No. <laughs> well, you can't say you don't like it until you have tried it. Okay, at this point I'm going to dry this layer so that we can glaze over it. I think this might be a, mon a monsteria or monstertia leaf, like the Swiss cheese plants, because I guess the older yeah. they get, the more holes they get mm -hmm. in their uh, in their leaves. And I've been wanting to paint one for the longest time, but I was worried that it wouldn't be very interesting. But then I thought, oh, if I have to make a color that I don't like work, that would be interesting to, to try. When you have a... Uh, paper like this and you haven't taped it down and you're drying it if you flip it and dry the back side for a while that will help it from buckling uh, someone says it's a split leaf philodendron oh okay You can see some pretty granulation happening in here um, from the chrome oxide green. And I did notice that when I was mixing it with the Indithrone Blue that the chrome oxide and the Indithrone Blue had a very soft uh, granulation in there that was pretty. I think they're both kind of sedimentary. I find that Lucas does grind their paints pretty finely, kind of like, um, kind of like Holbein does. It's a very smooth consistency of paint. Your ultramarine will granulate, but it's not going to granulate as much as it would like a Daniel Smith. So if you've never given them a try, they're a lot less expensive than other brands. So you can get like a, a half pan for a couple dollars, probably a full pan for a couple dollars, and you can try it out and see if you like that, that brand. I would do that before you buy like a big set just because, you know, that's kind of an investment. If you don't like it, then you're out that, you're out that money and you've got a palette to deal with. Okay. Now I think I'm going to go in and just darken some of the splotches. I might try doing a little lifting and seeing if I can, seeing how those colors lift. They ought to lift pretty well because those colors are pretty sedimentary. I think the indigo might have some violet and phthalo blue in it, so that might stain a little bit, but that's all right because the the uh, plant itself does have a little bit of like a, um, like a minty cool blue undertone, so I think that might be all right. 
So I'm going to see about lifting a little bit around in here where my dark ran. I'm using a menta scrubber. I'm just going to work it back and forth and then blot it. That really doesn't want to lift off all that well. I'm no, I don't think I did a lifting test for the Lucas paint when I first got it. Could be the paint doesn't lift all that well. It is milled pretty fine sometimes when they mill it fine. It doesn't want to lift very well. And this paper, I've had it for a while, so the sizing could be off a bit. I don't think I'm going to try lifting anymore because it is giving me kind of a mottled, blotchy look, and I don't really care for that. So I think I'm going to let that dry and work on some of the other uh, brown spots. I'm going to grab the uh, English Red. I'm just going to add it to the mix that I have on my palette. And I'm going to go in and just redefine some of these areas here. I can go over, I can go over with the chrome oxide and have a little bit of opacity. So it will cover up a little bit if I like got my, if my dark color wicked out more than I wanted it to. But I typically don't like to use my watercolors too thickly, but that is just nice to know that you do have that option with that color. The English red is also a color that tends to be a little bit more uh, opaque. And turn you, oops, I spot, can see spot some water drops. I like this when I saw this leaf picture I thought it'd be really fun to paint because usually um, you'll see very pristine perfect leaves and I think ones that are a little bit imperfect are a little bit more interesting to paint uh, Carla O if you were choosing between mission gold or core paints which ones would you choose or recommend um I would go with core because um, they flow, re I really love the way that they flow. Um, I feel like they last longer. And I think it's because the binder that's in it is a little thinner than gum Arabic. It just seems to, it seems like I've had a little dab on my, like on a travel palette that's lasted me so many paintings that I've wanted to like wash out my travel palette, but I can't bear to throw the paint away because I just can't seem to use it up. Um, More travel palettes. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so I would, between the two, I would say core, unless you're getting like a fantastic deal. I mean, obviously price would be a consideration. I wouldn't pay like double for the core, but if price and for both were the same, I would go with the core. But they're both good. The nice thing about gold, well, I mean, I'm not, I don't really know too much about the history of Mission Gold, but Core is made by Golden Art Materials, and they're very much sticklers for light fastness and testing the materials, and they just have such a good reputation that I would really trust their, uh, their light fast ratings. But I'm not saying that Mission Gold isn't trustworthy by any stretch of the imagination. They're, um, I think they're distributed by Martin Weber in the United States. But they did have a, t uh, a patch a while back where their paints were very, um, a lot of their paints weren't light fast. So I think they've improved stuff, but I think I would probably, you know, if given the choice between the two, go with the golden just because it's it's a, a little bit more of a well-known, well-respected company that I would trust. But I do like the Mission Gold too, so don't don't get me wrong. You can see a little feathering there with the paper still a little damp from where I tried lifting. I don't think that's a big deal for this type of shape that I'm painting, but just to let you know. And also you can notice, like look at like there, how almost black that brown looks and up here how it looks more red. As the pigments are settling into the paper and um, drying and mixing with what's underneath, you lose all of that vibrancy as, as it dries and settles into the other paints. That was a pretty extreme, um, example of it so I just wanted to bring it to your attention usually don't see that much of an example so don't freak out if your paint looks really bright when it's wet because it, it can shift a bit 
as it dries and absorbs. If you want more speckles on your leaves, go ahead and put more speckles. It's up to you. I posted a beginner landscape tutorial earlier this week on my YouTube channel. If anybody is uh, needing a want to brush up on their basics, or if they have any friends that want to learn watercolor, it's a uh, it's a painting of a stream that I saw driving back from Canada last week. It was actually at a rest area, and uh, it was just so pretty. I left out the outhouse that was right next to it. <laughs> <laughs> but weren't it for the outhouse, we wouldn't have gone there. <laughs> that was the reason for the stop. Yep. And I feel like this, this leaf ought to have something on it, especially since I've got that weird, uh, that weird area where I didn't wet the paper and I painted that chrome oxide and it kind of... Uh, adhered to the paper, absorbed in really well. I'm wondering if my paper might be might be old because it didn't do that on the other on my Aqua B and I've so I think I might that might just be an issue with old paper. I generally don't have a problem with buying in bulk and keeping it, but I think storing it in my basement. I usually don't I store my full sheets upstairs, but I've had torn down sheets down here for a while and uh, I that could have been down here for years in a semi damp area. Okay, I'm going to put a few more of these little dots in here. Got them a little bit bigger. I also wanted to mention the more you use a watercolor tin, the better it gets for mixing. So if you've got your tin and everything's beating up on it, um, just keep using it. it. It will get better and that goes for pretty much any brand I've ever used. Or you can even rub it with a a magic eraser you can remove stains but you can also it'll also uh help take some of the shine off of it so it'll it'll hold your paint better okay now i'm going to take the chrome oxide green i've got plenty of it left right there and add in some of the indigo and we'll make a vein color you can kind of see how milky that looks if I want to brighten it up, I can I can add some green gold to it as well, because that will give me color without any opacity. It makes it look a little more green and a little less gray. And I think I'm going to turn this upside down so I can pull the vein stroke towards me. And I will start here on the stem. And I usually use my fing my pinky to trace the paper, but I think my um, my brown is still wet, so I'm going to try just to keep a steady hand without doing that. that pretty well. And then I'm going to pull out the veins to the side. If we need to switch to a smaller brush, go right ahead. And these is going to look kind of bold right now, but don't worry, it's going to mellow as it dries and then we can also glaze over it. So. Uh, Heidi Cook, how do you know if your paper is too old? How can paper be too old? Well, sometimes, and I notice this with arches, um, and it might be because it's a gelatin sizing that the sizing can kind of just become inactive, I guess. Like it stops being a barrier. I don't know if it just environmental um, factors kind of eat it away or what. Um, and I don't know if this would happen with synthetically sized paper or not, but it just kind of stops. Like if you were to put a drop of water on your paper, it might not bead up and stay as a droplet of water. It might just absorb like a paper towel. So that's what I mean. It's definitely not like that you can't use it, but it might frustrate you. Um, like if you're trying to scrub, like I was, uh, like I was scrubbing and I wasn't getting any color up. 
Um, so things like that, it would give you, it would frustrate you, or maybe even doing some blending, it might frustrate you because everything's just going to soak right into the paper. I got in the habit of buying blocks of paper and they were just so much more convenient that I kind of forgot about some of my torn down sheets. <laughs> so then they sat in a folder exposed to the, uh, just kind of exposed to the environment here and sometimes they go in my bag and they're you know fall out of a kayak and <laughs> you know it's a rough life being one of my supplies because Arches is still my favorite paper I do like the um, the animal sizing which probably sounds really funny coming from a vegetarian it's a byproduct of the of the meat industry it's made from their bones uh, but the rest of my family consumes meat so I feel like it's using the whole animal at least Fabriano has a, um, a synthetic sizing that's pretty good. Okay. All right. I think I am going to uh, go in with a little bit of green gold and see how that would work on top of some of these darker colors. I don't know if it will stand up but yellows do tend to dominate sometimes when you put them in darks so we'll see when they dry whether they still appear to be there if not it will just give me a little bit of a variance in texture and I do intend on using a little bit of color pencil for accents um, because I didn't mask I didn't retain like the lights between the that light kind of border between the um, the, bra the brownish blackish leaf and the bright leaf so it's just uh, quicker and easier for me to do that with colored pencil. And that's how I prefer to work. But uh, if you're watching this now, I'm going to do it later. You totally could use wax to like just draw it accurately. Use a little wax to draw that in. Or you could use masking fluid. And I think I'm going to grab a little of that indigo. because I want to do a little bit of a shading, a subtle shading around that center vein. And this is pretty watery. It's like, probably like skim milk. I'm gonna dry that just so that I can layer over it without it running and feathering. And then we'll be able to see what our green gold did on the brown areas. It's really transparent, so I don't know if it'll show up. It I, my brain would tell me it probably shouldn't, but I've seen colors do weird things, so. It might just give me a little bit of a, um, of a sheen here and there. Okay, so I am going to take, I'm just taking this blue, and I actually think I'll go with my flat brush and mix up a little bit more. I'm wet my brush here. Get it to the right color that I want, which is just a really pale, uh, pale blue. Then I will blot off the excess from my brush, and I blot it from the close to the ferrule, so I still get the color at the tip, but I take out the excess moisture. And I am just going to kind of wisp it out from the center. Uh, Penny Cormier. Did you ever sort all of your watercolor tubes into colors rather than brands? Did you like it? Yes, I did, and yes, I did. And if you see my palette tour, you can see where I pull out the big, uh, the big box of the two big drawers of watercolor paints. You can hear my husband gasp when I pulled out. <laughs> he gasped and he just started laughing. He's like, "What do you have? Like secret drawers back there?" Because I kept pulling out palettes and palettes and palettes. <laughs> Okay, and I think I'll actually take a little bit of the uh, green gold here and add a little bit where I want to brighten things up a little bit. i got to make sure that I don't have too much moisture on there or I'm going to end up with some weird edges. Although I might not. If the sizing's gone bad in here, it might just absorb. I might not get hard edges where I don't want it. So, like, if, you, if you're wondering what sizing is, um, sizing is the stuff that keeps your your paint from absorbing into the paper. So a really hard sized paper would 
make more of your painting just your paper your stuff sit on the top um, and not sink in so your colors would be really really vibrant and an unsized paper would be like rice paper or a paper towel so like if you put color on it it would just kind of seep in there so you kind of want something that's kind of in between your paint just sitting on the top of your surface and it's seeping in uh, I'm going into the um, chrome oxide indigo mix here just adding a little bit more indigo I'm going to tap this in around the center vein where it's wet. I just don't want the, the veining to be really, um, I don't want to really be stark and stand out too much. So I'm trying to just kind of feather it in for the rest of the leaf. Uh, Carla O, I know you have lots of watercolor sets. Which ones do you find yourself reaching for most often? Hmm, that's a great question. Um... You know, I really like my old set of 24 full pan Cotman set that I did that beginner tutorial with. Um, that's a kind of tried and true. I grab that for on vacation sometimes to bring with me just because it's it's like a painting with an old friend. Um, and I don't have to worry about it being about wasting paint and it being too precious because the paint's pretty inexpensive. I also grab my Sennelier set a lot, uh, especially if I'm going to be doing a lot of layering. Uh, like if I know I want to spend a long time on something and I want to just, sometimes I just want to fester and fuss with a painting and I might want to spend an hour or two on it. I just want to, I just want to play and keep layering and not be done. Because sometimes, like when you're in the middle of a painting, like three quarters of the way through, that's like the best part of a painting. And it's so satisfying to see things come together. But sometimes you don't want to finish. And the Sennelier lets you layer and layer and layer and makes it almost impossible to overwork, in my opinion. So that's kind of, that's what I pick for that. And I also really like my Rembrandt set of 48. It's a palette like this, um, but it's a little, I find the Rembrandts to be a little more transparent than the Lucas. Um, and they were, that was probably one of the first, I bought the Lucas set first because I was, I was, the Rembrandt palette was, palette was more expensive and I talked myself out of buying that. So I bought the Lucas one on sale and I really liked it, but I always kept thinking, well, what about that Rembrandt one? What if that's way better? Cause that's why it's more expensive. And I bought it, and it wasn't way better. It was it was a little better, um, but I do also enjoy grabbing that palette and playing with it because I think because I spent so much money on it, I told myself you better use this palette, and so I used it quite a bit, and it made me kind of really really like it. The more I use the paint, the more I like it. So that's really hard to say because I have so many paints that I really like. <laughs> ask me ask me tomorrow. I'll give you four different yeah. answers that I didn't even mention today. All right, now I'm going to grab some color pencils. I have a few here that I um, that I used on my other one, so I know that's what I want. Um, I'm going to start with actually just a bright white, and what I'm going to do is put in these um, these really hard lines where we divide up the uh, the fresh green leaf from the brown leaf. Which I'm not sure if that brown leaf if there's something wrong with it, like it's dead or if it's just the way that plant looks. If anybody knows, they could let me know. I'm gonna slide this out of the way. Yeah, before you, if you're ever curious about a, um, a paint set, unless you find a really awesome deal on it, I would recommend that you buy a couple tubes or pans um, of colors that you're familiar with like I wouldn't buy crazy colors that you've never used before because it's going to make it really difficult to determine whether that's a good brand of paint or not. But like if you always use ultramarine blue and you know you're going to use it, you know, so it's not going to go to waste, get like ultramarine blue and permanent rose and sat green or whatever colors that you grab all the time and try those in a new line and see if you if you really like it. If you really like it and end up buying a set, you can always refill the pans with those um those tube colors so it's not going to go to waste but that way you'd get a nice um you'd be starting off with colors that you already knew a little bit about so if like the sap green was really weak and yucky then and like the crimson wasn't really transparent you know if you if you saw a couple colors you know you already knew how they're supposed to behave and they're not behaving then it would give you a really good idea of how that um how that whole set behaves and i say that being completely um weak when i see a good deal on a watercolor palette that I've never tried. <laughs> I find turning my pencil, um, I can kind of keep a hard, I can keep a, a 
the sharp edge without having to sharpen it too much. So I turn, that's why you'll see me turn my pencil in my fingers as I'm working. I'm just trying to uh, squeeze out a little more life from the lead before I have to resharpen it. You could also do this um, when you begin, like before you paint anything and um, you have like a little resist going on. But I like to do it after, especially when I've been using a color, colors that are a little more opaque because it, um, it gives a nice tooth to the paper and it just seems to really grab the pencil. Okay, and let's see, I'll grab a little of this yellow and just kind of add a little bit to the edges of that white just to make it not quite so stark. Do we have a good crowd today? Or are we? We do. We have 339 watching right now. Excellent. We had a question about your the brand of colored pencils you were using. Sure. These are Prismacolors. Um, Prismacolors are my favorite. And no, they're not everybody's favorite. But I find that for um, enhancing watercolors, if you want a more opaque pencil, they're excellent. If you prefer a more transparent pencil, um, the, uh, the Arteza ones are very inexpensive and they do great. Like if you want to add color pencil to your, and I'll show you, I did, I'll show you that painting we did last week. So if you want to add color pencil, but you don't want to have it look like colored pencil, the Arteza, you can barely tell that I use colored pencil on this. If I tip it, you, can, you don't even see any sheen hardly. So if you want your pencil to be a little more subtle and more transparent and not like be as bold and stand out like this, I would recommend the Arteza. Um, and they do have light fastness ratings on them, which is nice. And most of them are pretty good. They are a new company. So, um, you know, take that for, you know, what you will. Um, but they do offer light fast ratings on their pencils and it's all what, whatever your preference is. I prefer a more opaque pencil. So I gen generally prefer wax paper pencils to oil-based pencils. I actually just put away all my polychromos I had sitting on my, in racks on my, table a couple like two weeks ago because I just found I wasn't grabbing them very often. No, they're a little more popular. They're more expensive, but I just personally like working with Prismacolors more. And I got a little cream here. I just don't want that that line to be super, super white. But I like to put the white down first because it's really going to lay down that opaque color that you can tint with your other colors after. See there, I went with a yellow before I went with a cream and it's not as bright as these other edges. Just having that white underneath will give you that brighter edge. But if you want softer edges, like for these, um, these shapes that are more interior, do them with the cream or do them with the yellow first and then white over them and you'll get a more subdued look. Make sure your paper's dry before you do this because then otherwise you're just going to um, scratch the paper and leave kind of hard lines and, and dark lines in there from where you've damaged the paper. So you want to make sure you do that. Do that first. And then in the dark, so I actually want to put some where you can see where I put the green gold a little bit where the pigments kind of laid on top of the other colors, but it wasn't as uh, strong as I wanted. So I'm just going to go in with this. Uh, this is either lime pre or chartreuse pencil and just, and it's a dull pencil. What I'm going to do is just catch the texture of the paper and that's going to give me that really accurate, um, kind of, a, it almost looks like, um, like peeled paint texture on the leaf here. And I think that's what I really like about adding colored pencil to watercolor is that lovely texture that you can, that you can add. And when you do your lines, even though you're just kind of putting texture on, you still want to move your pencil. Like if you pretend that these lee, these veins are going, 
like they're reaching up from the center to the outside of the leaf that's kind of the you want to you want to shade parallel with those lines so that you get that you reinforce that veining and I'm gonna make this leaf come out front a little bit and I can add a little bit of yellow in there too And I'm going to um, do a little bit of cream up here on this overturned part and some here as well. And I'll do a little bit right there. And now I'm going to grab some shadow colors. I've got uh, Tuscan Red and Indigo and those are my two colors that I usually use instead of black because I like overlaying them and I get a nice lively shadow. And I'm going to start over here where I've got this underturned leaf. And I'm going to bring a little bit of a vein coming through here. If it carried through, it would meet up with that vein. And I can overlay it with some Tuscan Red. And my pencil's not really sharp here. When you do get into details, you might want to sharpen it just so you don't have to get hazy edges, but I just wanted to get that overturned area colored in. And it doesn't seem to matter too much what, uh, what color you do on the bottom. <clears throat> like I did the red and then I'm doing the blue over it. Um, it doesn't matter as much with colored pencil unless your paper's really smooth and you'd want to put your dominant color down first just to make sure you don't clog up the tooth before you get to adding what you need to add. And if say if your lines, uh, your border line isn't dark enough or maybe you didn't want to use colored pencil and you just kept it to uh, to watercolor, just darken the, the edge. So like if you had used wax um, to keep that edge or you'd use masking fluid or whatever and you didn't feel like it was contrasted enough, you could paint these darker colors in there and get that contrast so that it shows up a little bit more. I just recommend that you use as few colors as you can to get the point across so that way you don't end up um, creating discord in your painting. Type in a mile a minute over there. Talking about killing, I for whatever reason I have a ton of house plants, but mm -hmm. anytime I have a succulent, it just dies in my care. I, I've never oh, no. figured out how. You probably overcare for it. I've maybe. done both. I've ignored and overcared, and either way, they just die. Hmm. I heard that like because I've I seriously get tempted by house plants at the grocery store. And it's probably because I don't go to like flower shops or plant stores. I you know I'll. Like on purpose, I'll just happen to be grocery shopping and I'll see a plant that looks really cool and I'll bring it home and, you know, it dies in like two weeks. But then I had um, watched some, I don't know, Today Show or something and they said that how plants from the grocery store aren't designed to live more than like two weeks. Ah, Like they're more, they usually just kind of for gifts. They're more of like an impulse thing. Right. Which kind of made me sad. It's like, well, I don't want to buy something that's going to die in two weeks. Right. I usually buy my house plants from like a garden center. Yeah. And I mean, I've had, I've had all sorts of like, wandering juice with uh, Swedish ivy, you know, mm -hmm. pothos, you know, um, uh, well, I lied. I have one succulent that I've managed not to kill. I mean, I've had an assortment of houseplants over the years, ferns, all sorts of stuff. Succulents, man, I cannot keep those things alive. Maybe I your house is cool. Every, I've tried them in all of my different apartments, all of my different houses, all different types. I can't. I hmm. think they just see me coming. <laughs> they don't like you. And they're like, we don't want to live with you for the rest of our lives. We're going to die now. I have a jade that's going crazy. I just took it off my um, 
my windowsill and put it on an end table so I can enjoy it. Hopefully it does all right there. I think it like the heat. It's really, it's going nuts. Yes. I think I need to repot it because it's so big. Probably not because I that's how I've killed several oh, is maybe. repotting. <laughs> See, I, I, I kill all <laughs> the other plants. I just think it must be my neglect that keeps them going. So, I mean, I can grow, I've you know, flowers in the garden, herbs, vegetables, but whatever succulents are not... You can use a chartreuse um, pencil anytime you want to brighten something up. So if you feel like you want a little highlight here and there, you can go ahead and, and put that in. Or you can paint it in with your, um, do a glaze of the green gold because it's such a strong color. If something's too bright, do a glaze of chrome oxide because that will, that'll dull anything down. And you don't have to do this. I mean, these aren't really bright leaves. I just, I'm just enjoying playing with the color and now I'm going to use this the indigo on its own just to give me a little bit of definition on that vein down the center and some of the more uh, pronounced ones super light pressure I, it's kind of like I want to make this line in the center of the painted lines I bought one of those cute little uh, hanging ball terrariums last summer mm -hmm. at the grocery I store. I killed one of those too. Mine's still going, I think. <laughs> I actually just soaked down and the soil and like kind of readjusted my little things and popped in a couple of their little succulent yep. Uh, yep. clippings um, from my other ones to hope, hopefully spur it uh, along yep. a little yep. bit. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I felt terrible because someone, it was a birthday gift someone <laughs> ordered from a floral shop for me, had sent to the house. Oh yeah. <laughs> it lasted a year. And That's it not just bad. Died. Somebody gave me one of those uh, peace lilies with a betta fish swimming around in yeah. it. Yeah. And I kept that fish for years. I felt so bad. I'm like, I'm like I can't believe they sell things like this. What if people don't want to take care of a pet and they've got they're thrust with a pet, you know? And uh, I just thought I was just horrified that they, that existed. That like those plants with mm. a fish in them. And man, that fish lasted a long time. Yeah. Much longer than the plant. Well, yeah, those plants aren't supposed to be wet like that. Because I have one of those. Oh, They're really? usually peace oh. lilies is what they yes, are. Yes, that's what it was. I have yeah. a peace lily. Had that same one for years. In fact, I actually had to cut it down into smaller... Because that was one I had in one of those, my giant, giant tubs. And I mm -hmm. ran out of room in the house. I had nowhere to put it, so I had to cut it down. <laughs> those are pretty plants. And just for a final touch, I'm using um, Cloud Blue. I think it's Cloud Blue. Gosh, it's hard for me to read those tiny. Uh, light Cerulean Blue. Um, and I'm just, just kind of scumbling over there. Um, this Aqua Bee paper has less texture, so my lines are a little smoother and I didn't, it didn't use as much. This is really wearing down my pencils, just to let you know that the cold press arches is going to be much rougher than your Aqua Bee. But I just wanted to give it that little bit of a cooler blue undertone that it has. Kind of like the the uh, the uh, oxide of chromium has. And then I think I'll actually grab some of the oxide of chromium on uh, a round brush and I will just do a little bit of glazing. Oh, my teacup, I frighten the screen. And where's that guy? Right over here. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a bead of, of the color right up the stem and then I'm just going to kind of fade it out to the, kind of fill in some of the gaps from the colored pencil. And then I'm just going to soften it out with the flat brush. And there we have it. Does that look done to you, Sarah? I think it does. I think if you keep messing with it, it's going to be over. 
overworked. Yeah, that can happen pretty easily, especially with a simple subject like a leaf. Mm. Um, so I urge you to try, oh, before you go, it would be really fun if you guys, uh, in the comments after the stream's over, if you typed in my least favorite color is in the comments, I'd love to know what your least favorite color is. And then people watching this, like, um, cause people probably don't make it to the end on the replays of the live streams. They'll be watching like, why is everyone saying what they're leaving? What a <laughs> negative bunch of people. <laughs> oh, I thought it was supposed to be nice and friendly and everybody's talking about what they hate. Yes, but tell me what your what your least favorite color is. I'm curious. So I wonder if there's like one color out there that everybody just can't stand. Um, and I think, it, and then I urge you to use it in a painting. Like mm. pick that least favorite color, mix it with some other colors, try to find a good use for it. I'll just show you this one again since it's dry, um, and also show you the difference between the aqua bee and the arches. I have to say, I really like the aqua bee paper. Um, maybe because it's so inexpensive, I feel much more freer on it. But um, it's really a great quality paper. So I just don't want anyone to think that they have to go out and spend, you know, 20 to $30 for a small pad of arches when they can get a pack of 50 aqua bee sheets for um, $15. So I just want to let you let you know that it is 100% cotton and acid free. So you're not really sacrificing anything. And this was done with the same palette as this one, the brighter colors here. This one was done with the with the more earth tone colors. And I think they came out pretty similar both ways. So um, it just shows you how dominant the color chrome oxide green is and it kind of gives you a little idea of why it can be so difficult to work with it. Um, the mixtures that I did here, just I did a little mixing chart with those colors, and uh, there it does yield some beautiful earth tones. Even when you mix it with the brights, so you get some beautiful kind of like um, skin tones and grays, um, peaches, and just some subtle colors like some gray teals that would be pretty um, in landscapes and whatnot. So if you have the least favorite color, I urge you to try it. Chrome oxide green was my Waterloo for so long, but now I'm actually thinking that I might use it a little more often, maybe, <laughs> if I'm all out of sap green. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, please give me a thumbs up before you go. That really helps people find this these uh, videos. And I want to thank Jerry's Artorama for sponsoring this week. You can find the materials I used linked up below, along with a reference photo. And there's a coupon code for Jerry's. That coupon code is good for non-sale items. So, um... Hopefully you can use that on what you want to buy or the sale price is so good that it's better off than the coupon. Do you have anything to add? All set. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Until next time, happy crafting.